learning thermally conductive compounds. Today we are going to have a very thick agenda and uh, uh, we are going to give a, a proper view to what is a thermally conductive compound. We are going to talk about how to design with a thermally conductive compound and we will share some expertise and some experience concerning successful case histories when it comes to properly exploiting the properties of thermally conductive plastics. My name is Luca Posca. I am the technical manager of uh, technical assistance manager at LATI. I've been working for LATI for 20 years in the special products, the development and technical assistance. Today here with me, we have Mr. Andrew Donkin, who is the responsible for the UK market. You can just uh, ask Andrew any kind of question concerning uh, product availability and any other uh, anything else concerning LATI and LATI products. I would like to thank all of you for your attention and I would like to thank Plastic City for supporting this, uh, this webinar. And I strongly recommend you to download uh, the documents that you will find in the event board, in the shared file folder. You can download all the brochures and the technical data sheet concerning the thermally conductive compounds we will talk about this afternoon. So now, I would go jump directly into the presentation, and here we go. Let's talk about thermally conductive plastics. It's a very tricky topic, and there is a lot to learn, actually. Uh, this is the agenda. We will spend some words talking about LATI, who we are, what are we doing on the market. Then we will give a look at thermally conductive plastics and compounds, how they are produced and what they are capable of. We will talk about the base resins and the additives because not anything, not any plastic can be transformed into a thermally conductive plastic. And we will give a look at how properties are measured because there is a lot to learn even in the way we have to measure the material properties, because these compounds are not traditional compounds. They are very peculiar and they require a lot of experience and know-how. The real core of the presentation is about some case histories. We will talk about design for lighting components, which are more or less for the moment being are the driving force for thermally conductive plastics. We will talk about the Whitecroft case study. Whitecroft is an English company and we work with them to develop a full range of high power LED lamps cooled with thermally conductive plastics. At the end of the presentation, uh, we will see some other case histories concerning other industrial sectors, and I will be glad to answer all your questions. So you can uh, write the question in the chat box you see in the lower right corner. At the end of the presentation, we'll spend some time chatting about your questions and uh, some topics about this kind of of plastics. Now a few words about LATI, who we are. LATI is a family-owned industrial operation. It was founded in 1945. Today it is still in the hands of the third generation of the, of the Conterno family. Uh, we have two production sites in Italy with a 40,000 ton cap um, capacity, more than 2,500 active products, and uh, uh, we have also have some tall compounders for abroad markets like China and Brazil and the United States. We have more than 280 employees, and I would like to focus your attention on the fact that more than 20 people are working in the research and development and the technical service. So LATI is a strongly technical-minded and strongly technical-focused company. We do not deal with commodities. Let me say we do not deal with unfilled products, ordinary products. We love to stick to special products and special applications. The base of, of, of the pyramid of, of uh, our pr uh, products is made by, let me say, uh, glass fiber reinforced materials. Then we have engineering plastics, which are various kinds of mineral field and so on. But the, the tip is the high performance. The high performance, which is our strategic core business. Uh, we deal with structural compounds for metal replacement. We deal with electrically and thermally conductive plastics for special applications. We also deal with self-lubricants, which is a very wide family of compounds, more than 600 products active in these self-lubricant compounds. And we are also working in the 3D printing. What is the LATI approach to the market? Of course, uh, we are a technical minded uh, company, so we love to listen to the market requirements. We love to share with our customer 
project, uh, project requirements. We try to improve our product uh, portfolio by uh, evaluating the material performance with finite element analysis, which is offered for free for our customers. Then we work on the product by themselves and we work with formulation, plastics, measurements, and so on. We fine tune the material. Lati is a tailor made compounder, so we love to fine tune materials to properly answer to the customer requirements. And of course, we work with the customer to start the production with proper molding assistance. So we have an all around approach to the market. We are proactive and reactive, of course. We listen to the market and we propose to the market. Now, let's see something more about thermally conductive plastics. As you know very well, plastics are not thermally conductive. Plastics are thermally insulative. So we have to uh, think about how to produce this kind of, of, of materials. We take a base resin and we take a functional filler. We mix them into an extruder and try to improve the thermal conductivity and the thermal management of the resulting compound. It is not a straightforward job because, as you can see in the picture in the lower left corner, if you put a small amount of conductive filler, you will have, generally speaking, a poor heat flow. So the material will have a very poor uh, heat performance. It will be an insulant material. You have to boost the concentration of the functional filler up to really unbelievable amounts. We are talking about 70% of graphite and 80-85% of conductive ceramic to proper help, to proper improve the thermal conductivity. And this is not enough because also the extrusion process has a very important function in the development of thermally conductive plastics. Because when you have such a huge amount of filler, you have to be able to properly disperse this kind of filler in the matrix in order to have a very homogeneous and a very even uh, material behavior. Otherwise, you will have a poor mechanical and thermal performance. Last but not least, we have to manage some kind of compromise between properties because no customer is willing to buy just a thermally conductive compound. The material has got to be thermally conductive, but it also must be mechanically reliable. It must be um, it must offer a good surface finish. It must be impact and chemical resistant and so on. So you have to find the best compromise between thermal conductivity, mechanical resistance and other properties in order to have a really reliable plastic. We started working with this kind of plastics in year 2003 when we produced the first thermally conductive compound. In 2005, we have the first industrial application and uh, during these years, we have been working with different fillers in order to improve and to have the best performance, the best compromise. Today, we have more than 60 products available, more than 60 thermally conductive products available, and I strongly encourage you to give a look at them on our website, where you will also find a lot of winning case histories, very interesting case histories. Just give a look. I do not want to make any uh, pro propaganda on this. Just download the brochure and uh, have a nice time reading. There is a lot of interesting topics. As I told you before, there is a lot, the, a lot to learn in the production of thermally conductive compounds. Not only the base selection, the base resin selection, and the best filler selection, but also in the production and the fine tuning of this kind of products. Let's give a look at these topics a little bit better. The base resin. Of course, the base resin is not is not a joke. It is the first the first brick of your wall. It is the most important step. Not only high performance resin, but also commodities can be transformed into thermally conductive plastics. So we are dealing with commodities with high end plastics in the same way. The first requirement, of course, is thermal resistance. The plastic, the base resin, the matrix must be selected according to the thermal requirements. So you cannot use a polypropylene if you have 150 degrees C for, let me say, for under the bonnet application in the automotive industry. So you have to select the best resin for your application. The second step 
is please pay attention to chemical resistance because most of these application must face very complicated environments, just like an example, like under the bonnet. So it's not wise to put an amorphous resin in under the bonnet application or to put a low, a, let me say, a polyamide or a polyester where you have high steam or a high concentration of hot water. So please, take care to the chemical resistance. Then we have the mechanical resistance because filling the base resin with such a huge amount of, 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 uh, of filler will put severe stress on the plastic material. Please be uh, advised that you cannot expect top mechanical resistance from thermally conductive plastics, but a very accurate compromise must be sought after, especially when it comes to self-threading screws and uh, snap fits and small features like that which may be too brittle for your application using thermally conductive compounds. Pay attention to mechanical resistance because that's a really very tricky point. Last but not least, not all base resins can accept the same amount of filler. So we have some plastics that can swallow, let me use this word which is not very adequate, but they can swallow a lot of fillers like polypropylene, like polyamide 6, polyamide 12, PPS, and some others which are not that easy to work, like, let me say, PBT or, or PPA. We have a lot of products developed on PPS, on polyamide 6, polyamide 12, and polypropylene, but we are willing to test also other resins in case you need it. Let's talk about the fillers now. We have seen the base resins, now let's talk about the fillers. We have two kinds of fillers. For sure, you already know this. Ceramics. Ceramics have a fair performance when it comes to thermal conductivity. They are electrically insulative, so they are very good for the electrical market in general because if you produce a housing with a thermally conductive plastics featuring ceramics, you will no longer need any electrical insulation. Your housing will be already electrically insulative. They can be colored somehow, let me say not bright, uh, shades, but they can be somehow colored. They can be transformed into flame retardants. We, we have thermally conductive flame retardants plastic, and they also show a very good dimensional stability. Um, we will see later that dimensional stability is a really mandatory requirement for a lot of uh, lighting application. Dimensional stability means adequate capability to, tra to transport heat from the heat source to the heat sink. So this is absolutely very, very important. The second kind of filler is graphite. Graphite is electrically conductive, and this may be an issue. It's black, and this may be another issue, but it offers outstanding thermal conductivity. The best numbers we have, we have, been, we have been able to achieve were achieved by using thermally conductive plastics filled with graphite, up to 70%. Conductivity can be in the field of 20 to 30 watt or meter Kelvin, which is 100 times the number of ordinary plastics. Graphite is also a very, a very good product when it comes to value for money. So if you want to have a good performing thermally conductive plastic, do not look for uh, exotic fillers. Go for graphite. You, if, if you can allow your part to be electrically conductive, go for graphite and you will be more than happy. Last but not least, you can paint graphite-based products because graphite is electrically conductive. So you can also uh, use powder paints like epoxy and, uh, and cooking in, uh, in, in oven and you will have a more than satisfactory result. Just to give you an idea of the lattice compounds, they are all produced with resin and filler compound uh, is uh, achieved by finely dispersing these fillers in highest amount. Uh, if you look at the, our, our website or the brochure, you will find some funny names describing the Lati Contour product, but don't worry because the first numbers describe the resin, the second number describes the amount of the first filler. So we have, just to give you an idea, Lati Contour 72, GR70 means 70% graphite polyamide 6, and that's it. It's a very, very straightforward description. 
Now, we have we have talked we have been talking a lot about these plastics, but what are the real advantages of using a thermally conductive plastic instead of metal? Uh, it's not in the price per kilo. I want to be really very. You, I need you to get me straight on this. It, do not look for plastic as a cheap alternative. Plastics are not cheap alternative to aluminum, to zamac, or to any other uh, metal. But they will offer you very interesting bottom line cost because with plastics, if you are if you use plastics pro properly, you will be able to have a very satisfactory bottom line cost because you will be able to save a lot of costs along the way. First, plastic allow a lot of design freedom because you can produce in one single shot a very complicated part uh, featuring, um, let me say, snaps, featuring uh, uh, screw seats, uh, bosses, uh, and of complicated geometry, various thin walls, without machining, without doing anything. You just injection mold the cavity, the, the geometry, and you pick up from the tool an already working part. The look can be really very interesting, especially when it comes to, to the deep black of graphite field product. They are very light, thermally conductive plastics are extremely light. The density of, a, of an average thermally conductive plastic is 1.5, which is close to one half the density of aluminum. So even if the cost per kilo is higher, the cost per liter, so the, the volume you pay, will be one half. With the same weight, you get double of the material. And this is a very important, very, very important topic, especially when it comes today to the electric mobility and other industrial sectors where lightness is mandatory, is absolutely fundamental. Every gram you, you are able to save on electric automotive, on uh, uh, aerospace or uh, transport in general, is money gained. So lightness is really one of the winning points of, this, of these products. One step production, and that's where the saving comes. That's where the saving comes because you will have no need for post-processing operation. No deflashing, no the sprueing, no, no um, anodization, no kind of sandblasting or stuff like that. You pick up from the tool, from the mold, the finished part. So you save a lot of expensive and environmental not friendly processes, like washing with solvents and stuff like that. The part you pick up from the tool is finished. And that's the reason why the last point of this, present, of, of this slide speaks about the green inspiration of thermally conductive plastics. They are lighter. They require a lot of energy, less than metals, for production and transformation. And they can be recycled forever. So this is really something extremely interesting, especially in the next years, we will be forced to design for recycling and design for repairing. These are the keywords, designed for recycled, designed for repairing. These will be the mantras of the next years when it comes to the electric industry, to appliances, to automotive and so on. M products will be, will be uh, recyclable and designed for repairing. And that's where plastics can really make the difference. Complicate products. Complicate products require complicate property description. Characterization is not straightforward. In Latio, we use the uh, net laser flash equipment, which is um, designed to measure thermal diffusivity. And then from thermal diffusivity, we normally um, measure the thermal conductivity. On our web, uh, website, you will find the technical data sheet. Please give a look at the thermal conductivity numbers because you will find one number in case of fully isotropic filler. In that case, you have just one number describing the property, the thermal conductivity of the material in all directions. But you will also see two numbers in the case of non-isotropic fillers. What are non-isotropic fillers? Graphite and boron nitride. Graphite and boron nitride 
have a very peculiar shape. They are flake shaped. So during the injection molding, you have a very strong orientation of the filler along the, the walls. This orientation is really the redetermining step, let me say, of any uh, thermal property of the material. If you look at this uh, and at the picture right, you will see that orientation of the flake is not even across the wall thickness. You will have a strong orientation along the flow close to the to the wall um, to the wall borders, and you will have a random orientation in the in the bulk of the wall thickness. This kind of orientation is creating a lot of difference when it comes to thermal conductivity along the flow or in plane and across the flow through plane. If you measure thermal conductivity in plane, you will see that these numbers are much, much higher than through plane. And this is a big issue, a big issue because this kind of peculiar behavior is really inhibiting a lot of development in thermal conductive application. That's also the reason why you will see two numbers in thermal conductive description in our technical data sheets, on plane, in plane, and through plane. Now, it is very complicated to have satisfactory results if you ignore this. We already made some presentations and some speeches in, the, in 2019, before the COVID mess, uh, trying to explain how important, how relevant it is to properly use a flake orientation tensor to design parts the best way. Now we are going to see how it works, because this tip is really making the difference between a successful application of thermally conductive plastics and a disappointing unsuccess if you ignore this. And we learned, we learned this the hard way. OK, let's talk about design for lighting components. But this presentation, I want to repeat this, is not just on lighting. You can use these kind of tips and this kind of, of um, topics also in other industrial sectors. Now, let's. this is a, a case history we studied a couple of years ago, but it's still very, very, let me say, interesting to, to, to study. Let's, let's pretend we have to build a very big, high power uh, beamer using a circuit on board LEDs and a plastic heat sink. Let's pretend that the circuit on board LEDs are 25 watt each. So we have 50 watts applied to the plastic heat sink. It's a big power, believe me. 50 watts LED is a lot of power and they produce a lot of heat. Even if LEDs today have a very good efficiency, higher than 30%, 40%, there is a lot of heat to be, to, to be managed, especially when it comes to plastic heat sink. Let's suppose we have an open free convection, natural convection of air. Please note that this does not apply to forced convection. If you need forced convection, so if you need a fan blowing on the heat sink, metal has a lot of chances to behave better than plastics. But there is a lot of applications which work with free convection. That means free air with no fans blowing air. This is a very chunky part because it is a 25, uh, 25 centimeters times uh, 15 times 6. The average thickness is 4 millimeter. The selected material is polyamide 6, 50% graphite. How do we design this? How do we design this heat sink to be capable to handle at least 50, uh, let me say 25, 30 watt of heat. Okay, this is the mathematical approach. The incoming heat is applied with a spreader on the red surface. There is a free convection and radiation as well. Please don't forget that radiation is really playing a major role because especially if the materials are black, like graphite field plastics. We calculate all the necessary numbers that must be used in uh, finite element analysis when it comes to the proper description of air around the heat sink. I do not want to spend time on this mathematics and physics. You can, you can give a look at them on, on your own. 
because the real core of this discussion is, is here. Once you have all the numbers, you just run a finite element analysis and you will have a temperature description all over the geometry, which will say if the project in itself is feasible or not. This is very important because you do this before cutting the tool. You do not want to do this after the, the, the tool is cut because then you have to fix the, the tool and you will lose a lot of money. So before everything, you run a finite element analysis and verify if the project in itself is feasible or not. But this is not enough because in this approach, in the first, in the very first approach, we simulated the plastic material as perfectly homogeneous and isotropic, even if it was graphite filled. We had uh, an overall temperature distribution description, which was satisfactory, but we learned along the way that this is not enough. And we already explained this uh, last year in a very interesting uh, event I had in, uh, in, uh, in Germany. Now, let's simulate it a different way. Let's first of all evaluate the flake orientation using a Moldex 3D, a mold flow simulation, a Moldex 3D simulation. You simulate the way the part is filled using the proper melt description uh, achieved by, by, by the Taiwanese uh, lab of Moldex 3D. They give you the viscosity curves, the shear stress versus viscosity, the PVT curves, and so on. So you can have a really reliable description about how the flakes will orient during the injection phase on the geometry and through thickness. This is very important. And through thickness, you have as an output, you have the so-called orientation tensor, which is exactly what I'm talking about. Is It describes the way the flakes will orient all over the geometry. Then you can use this orientation. You see the, the detail here in this picture. You see all these color dots describing how many flakes are oriented along the specified direction. You can use this datum to have a proper calculation of local, actual local thermal conductivity and rerun the simulation. You can see in the two pictures at right, the difference between the homogeneous isotropic approach and the anisotropic approach, the orthotropic approach, which is better describing the real, the actual flake orientation all over the geometry. The results can be really uh, upsetting, let, let me say, it can be really disappointing because time to time you, uh, in, in, this, in this very case, we thought we had, uh, we were close to the solution with the homogeneous isotropic and it was not like that. But the, the, the improved method using actual local thermal conductivity provided a lot of help in developing this application. This is the real part and these are other parts that we have been developing during these years. Uh, talking about uh, lighting sector. Now I want to spend some time talking about the, the latest development we had, which was really very satisfactory for us and for our customer Whitecroft as well, and for ProTool, which is the, uh, the, the tool maker. They're all England-based companies, and we were very happy to work with them because we, we really had some, some pleasant time and some very, very interesting results, thanks to their contribution. The job looked very complicated since the very beginning. The part you see here is the heat sink, the, the, the medium sized heat sink of a full range of LED lamps, high power LED lamps. Why did it look so complicated? Because the heat sink is very compact for the power it is supposed to handle. We were worried since the very beginning because the fins and the walls had a very uh, critical thickness in the, and, and size. More than everything, the, the amount of heat that this heat sink was supposed to handle was really very, very high. Uh, the top, the top uh, line is um, 5,000 lumen, but this very application is 3,000 lumen. And the size is about, I can't remember the exact figure, but, but I think it's about 10 or, or, or 12 centimeters, something like that. The part was extremely compact and it had very tight requirements. 
The material we selected was Laticonter 62, GR50, and GR70, which is polyamide 6, 50, and 70% graphite. These are the top performers of our range. These are the products that provide the best thermal conductivity in general. The first thermal analysis looked very satisfactory. We used an homogeneous uh, isotropic approach and the temperature we measured was encouraging because we had a 75 degrees C. The limit was 85. The, li the temperature limit, which must not be overcome, was 85. With the homogeneous isotropic, we had a satisfactory 75 degrees C, but when we simulated proper injection actual flake orientation and actual thermal performance of this very part, the result we got was this. The real part was performing much worse than the forecast. And this was confirmed by using the non-isotropic approach. So using the real flake orientation. So this part had a big issue, which was confirmed by, by the, the use of, uh, of, of sensors and uh, and the heat sensitive cameras on the real part. You can see the, the temperature uh, detected on the surface were even higher than 90, were much close to 100 degrees C. So the first tip was that the simulation using the isotropic approach provided poor results. And it was much, much better to run a non isotropic simulation. Otherwise, uh, we may provide wrong results. And this is very, very, very bad. We had to improve the performance of the part in itself. Improving thermal conductivity means reorienting the flake in the best way, in the most profitable way. And you can do this in various ways. And that's what I'm re really here to share with you. How can you manage orientation and thermal performance on such a complicated part and such a demanding part? The, 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 the result you see here is the flake orientation tensor. The orange reddish uh, base you see here indicates that, that more or less all flakes are oriented along the flow on the base of this heat sink where the LED device is placed. It means that the base of the heat sink will not transport heat through the thickness. And that's the reason why the performance of the heat sink were so poor. How can we manage reorienting the flakes in a, in a good way, in a really profitable way on the base of this device? by modifying the geometry in itself. We increased the, the thickness of, of the base. This was the first step. We also, we actually, we tried also other, other, other geometry improvements, but what was really making the difference is the base thickness, because increasing the base thickness, you, you force the, flake, the graphite flakes to lose orientation and to have a more randomly orientation. And randomly orientation allows better through plate thermal conductivity values. We also selected different injection layouts. We modified the injection speed. We modified a lot of parameters because we had to provide a good, a good reply to the customer. The results are here shown. The first two columns indicate the difference you get by using an isotropic or non-isotropic approach. And you can see you have up to 10 degrees C just changing the material model. Then you have injection layout. And you see in this case, the differences are much lower. Injection layout in this very case, I put the stress on this, in this very case, the injection layout was not playing a major role because the base where the heat sink um, meet the, the LED lamp was more or less filled the same way. The real difference is achieved by properly sizing 
the wall thickness. So geometry and material model play a major role in obtaining a really winning, winning application. But of course, this was not enough because even if you have the best material description, even if, even if you have the best thermal performance, this is not enough to have a successful case history. In this very case, another issue was provoked by the loss of dimensional stability due to the thickness in itself. The base where the PCB of the circuit on board was applied to the heat sink was not flat enough. And flatness is absolutely mandatory when it comes to PCBs producing a lot of heat, which is supposed to be managed by the plastic heat sink. Even if you have a, a even if you have a 0.02 millimeter gap between the PCB and the heat sink, you will have a temperature peak because of air, which is playing as an insulative device. Even if you apply a conductive tape, you will still have risks concerning poor heat transport through the heat sink. The picture on your left side is showing the flatness of this part. All in all, we had more or less 0.1 loss of flatness from, let me say, from the peak to the, um, to the, to, to the lowest point. Uh, the column on the, on, the, on the left is showing uh, uh, 0.02 millimeter, the red, and 0.08 millimeter 0 0.09 so all in all it's something more or less 0 0.1 this is a big problem so we also had to solve this by properly modifying the injection time and so on in order to get the best uh, let me say the best contact the best quality of the contact between the heat sink and the circuit on board otherwise the this device would not work properly This is the, the real part. And I'm, today I'm really very proud to share with you this application because uh, um, we have been working a lot uh, in order to improve the performance of this part. You can visit the Whitecroft webpage and uh, better investigate how the, the full range of these uh, plastic beamers and uh, uh, very powerful lamps has been successfully managed by Whitecroft and Pro Tool. And um, this is just the beginning, I mean, why did Whitecroft select this material? Not just for the performance, because aluminum would be as good as well, even better, for sure. But why? First of all, because performance, when it comes to natural convection, so when it comes to devices which are not undergoing the, the flow blown by a, by a fan, the performance of plastics, of conductive plastics, is comparable to aluminum if the conductivity of plastics is above the threshold of 10 watt on meter Kelvin. If the conductivity is above this threshold, plastics and the metals will perform more or less the same. The weight. These devices are hanging from the ceiling. These parts are weighing 42% less than aluminum. Production cost, less 40%. Environmental impact, amazing. We're talking about 100% recyclable plastics. Energy saving, a lot, because the process temperature moves from 500 degrees C of aluminum down to 260 of melt plastic. The equipment costs are much lower because your tool has a much longer lifespan when it comes to plastic. These kind of plastics are designed not to create any kind of corrosion or abrasion on your tools. So your tools will be more than happy to transfer lactic counter compounds uh, for years. You can see this tool's lifespan is plus 500% compared to aluminum. And there are no finishing operations. So you pick up from the molding machine your heat sink, your housing, finished. All you have to do is to assemble the PCB, the lens, and your lamp is finished. You have to do nothing more than this. This was lighting. 
but thermally conductive plastics are not just lighting. Let's give a look at other successful applications and case histories. Some other lighting applications, like this Artemide lamp called Ameluna that was designed for Mercedes, was produced using polyamide 6, 50% ceramics, V0, halogen-free flame retardant. Successful automotive application. Continental decided to produce this vacuum pump for the brake system using polyamide 6, 50% graphite and glass fibers in order to replace metals and introduce a much lighter solution. So medical application. When it comes to thermally conductive plastic, you can imagine how useful they can be to transport heat or low temperatures in the right spot all over the human body or in specific uh, the medical equipment. In this very application, the producer of uh, high-end catheters, Enki, used uh, a flexible polypropylene elastomer filled with 80% boron nitride to create a thermally conductive cannula. Electronics. I mean, uh, all electronics are supposed to be smaller and smaller in the years to come. And they are also supposed to handle more and more power. Just think about electric automotive. Everybody now is chatting about electric automotive and the future of automotive. But when it comes to auto, electric autos, we are talking about high amperage, high voltage, meaning a lot of heat, meaning a lot of heat build up in specific regions of your automotive application, like lamps, like uh, uh, rectifiers for your uh, uh, charging device at home, uh, you, you name it. Just think about all the applications which are today cooled but with a, let me say, with a metal, metal part or with specific potting resins. What about producing them using thermally conductive plastics? You see this bobbin was enclosed in a PPS, 70% ceramic housing, and this instead of potting potting resin, and this helped this application to perform much better in a much more reliable way. And then we have sensors. Wherever you can bring heat or low temperature, you may have the need to over mold some electric application. In this very application, the customer Drega, which is a German company, um, produced this um, uh, alcohol meter using a Laticonter, Laticonter uh, 906 with 70% graphite. All the electric devices, the heating devices and the chips are over molded. So, Thermally conductive plastics can also be used to overmold, to overmold electric equipment because they have very low viscosity, they do not require excessive pressure to fill the cavity, and all in all, they will provide a very satisfactory result, even when it comes to very small devices, overmolded electronic devices. Okay. Now, I really hope I was able to give you a decent webinar talking about thermally conductive plastics. Uh, I think there is a lot to talk about. I invite you to visit our website. And um, all, I, all I can say is that once you have downloaded the available uh, brochures and documents in the, in the shared files, you can see on the uh, event uh, dashboard on the upper right corner. If you have any kind of doubts, you can drop me an email or Mr. Donkin you can, uh, you, you can drop an email to Mr. Duncan. You can manage a meeting with, with Andrew, who will be more than happy to give you more details uh, and to help you in developing your very applications using thermally conductive plastics. Now, the presentation is over. I think we can go back and see if we have any question. Any question. Okay. Okay. Okay, let me check the questions. We have four questions, actually. I will start with the last one, which is coming from Mike from the UK. Okay, Mike is asking about these disadvantages, disadvantages of these plastics. Okay, uh, 
I want to answer this question first. I have four, but I have to. I want to ask you to answer this question for because these advantages of plastics, of this kind of plastics, can really be um, a pain in the back. So it is much better if anybody knows what is dealing with, in order not to get disappointed. Because once you get disappointed, it's very hard to go back to this kind of solution. So, which are the the, the biggest disadvantages of these plastics? First of all. I would say that the biggest disadvantage is related to the mechanical performance. That's the reason why we have been working a lot in order to increase the impact resistance and, uh, let me say, tensile performance of this kind of plastics as well. We have some graphite glass fiber filled plastics which behave very well. But all in all, do not expect an, a, a proper metal replacement applications when it comes to mechanical performance. Anyhow, we can somehow deal with the with the mechanical performance in order to have a more than decent performance of this kind of product, especially when it comes to self-threading screws, which are often used to assemble the PCBs or the lens or even various parts together. Today, we have a very good performance when, when it comes to the self-threading screws behavior, and we can share with you some, some data. Okay, second question. Competition with traditional met metals. Okay, I think we have already uh, we have already explained this. It is possible to compete with metals when it comes to some specific application. We cannot say that plastics will replace metals, one hundred percent. No way, because metals have a much higher figure, have a much better. Um, property layout in general. We can compete with metal on some specific applications, especially when you have to deal with uh, natural convection. So with parts which are supposed to cool down only using the surrounding air, no, not, not uh, with a fan blowing or stuff like that. It is very hard to think about plastic parts which can manage kilowatts huge amounts of power. We have been also, also been working a lot on uh, radiators and stuff like that. It is possible to, to, transform, to transport one kilowatt with a very large surface. But if you need very high power densities, metals are still the way. Anyhow, a lot can be done, especially by proper designing, OK? The third question. OK, is it possible to get this video link? I think so. The, uh, the colleagues of Plastic City are recording this presentation. And you will get this. OK, the flow mobility of, of the melt. The flow mobility of the melt is uh, an, another very big, important issue. Flow mobility of the melt is uh, carefully taken under strict uh, consideration because it is pointless to make a hugely filled compound with a very high thermal conductivity, which is impossible to mold. It would be pointless. And all in all, you do not want to have plastics which are requiring huge machines, huge pressures to be improperly injection molded. All the thermally conductive compounds of LATI have been designed in order to have the best fluidity achievable considering the amount of filler. So the base resin is selected using only some specific um, parameters because we want the materials to be as fluid as possible. We want it to fill even very low thicknesses because we are talking about connectors, we're talking about electronic applications. So we do not, we, we, we are not supposed to fill one centimeter thick walls. We are talking about 0 0.5, 0 0.7 millimeters. So we need fluidity rely on the fluidity of our thermally conductive compounds because they are designed for that very purpose. A question in Italian. Uh, exotic fillers like, like graphene or carbon nanotubes. Yes, we have been working with both of them, but for electrical conductivity, not for thermal conductivity. For electrical conductivity, we tested both carbon nanotubes and graphene. Graphene uh, was not very successful. We're still working on that. Carbon nanotubes provided a lot of uh, very, I would say, exciting results because 
electrical conductivity of uh, carbon nanotubes is so high that resulting compounds are really amazing as electrical conductors, even if you put 0.5 or 1% of carbon nanotubes inside. The real problem with carbon nanotubes is dispersion, is to have a proper dispersion of these very, very small clusters. You have to open the cluster and disperse it into the matrix. This requires a lot of uh, know-how about dispersion. Uh, a proper screw is, uh, is required. Anyhow, in our catalog, we have some electrically conductive compounds called LATI-OM, uh, featuring carbon nanotubes, which are working very well, especially on unfilled plastics, like, let me say, polycarbonate, because in that case, you still preserve the flexibility of the matrix in itself. Or if you can somehow use the segregation phenomena, so you fill the compound with some other filler, pushing the carbon nanotubes in the interstices between different phases. In that very case, you will have another very interesting solution when it comes to electrical conductivity, but no news about uh, thermal conductivity. Another question, uh, do you have ULV0 homologated lattice contour materials? Yes, uh, you can just uh, give a look at our website. We have, as far as I can remember, I think six or seven, but the number is growing on a yearly base because um, we are looking forward pushing these thermally conductive compounds also in the in the railway industry, in the transport in general, uh, and, the, and the appliance, and the automotive, and the electric automotive, which will have a, 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 a regulatory situation which will be very close to the appliance because an electric car is more or less like an appliance. So I think that all the regulatory affairs of electric automotive will require flame retardancy. So uh, we have graphite based and the ceramic field based compounds which are UL V0 approved full range. So just give a look at our website. Uh, another question, can you address the moisture and drying issues with high loaded PA or hygroscopic materials? Yes, uh, it is not, it would be not so proper to say we can address this. Uh, of course, uh, um, this is something that requires attention. I mean, uh, polyamides will keep on absorbing wa uh, water even if you, uh, you fill them a lot. But of course, the more you fill them, the lower is the plastic fraction which is capable of, of absorbing water. So, all in all, we never had issues concerning, uh, uh, I would say, a degradation of uh, thermal performance because of moisture pickup of, of polyamide. Because we are talking about plastics compounds which feature 70, 50 to 85% of non agroscopic filler. And this means that the agroscopic resin is just 20 to 30, 35%. All in all, the effects of this kind of um, issue related with moisture pickup of foliamide is, I would say, is addressed by itself, by the formulation of the compound in itself. Okay, I have, uh, I think I have uh, another question concerning the design. Ah, okay, is it necessary to, pro uh, to uh, use proper design tools to work with thermally conductive plastics. I would say uh, in this presentation, I think we have um, we have been talking about uh, how necessary it is to use proper design tools and proper know-how if you want to get the best out of a thermally conductive plastic. As long as you're willing to use um, an isotropic filler, like some ceramics, some metal oxides or stuff like that, you can use the general homogeneous isotropic. You will see no differences. Even if you use the um, homogeneous isotropic approach and uh, you are capable of running a finite element analysis using um, finite element analysis using an isotropic homogeneous approach, you can get reliable results also with flake-based fillers like graphite or boron nitrite. Boron nitrite is another flake-shaped filler. But you will not guess, get the best, the best forecast of the property present of the property of the material itself. If you want to get the best out of it, 
if you want to narrow down your design uh, your design to the very basic if you not, do not want to have an oversized part if you not want to to put some thickness where this is not necessary i strongly recommend to have first of all a proper material description and i'm talking about thermal conductivity along plane and through plane then i would say you need to the, the state of the art is the best material description a feeling simulation to, to have the orientation tensor and then translate this orientation tensor into local thermal conductivity and run the finite element analysis thermal simulation using local real values this will really improve quite a lot the quality of of your result uh, some tools are being designed by moldex uh, we will see this at the end of september there's going to be a presentation about how to use moldex 3d using uh, and have the best forecast of thermal conductivity uh, using flake shaped uh, fillers uh, we did it on by ourselves uh, uh, but the answer is definitely yes if you want to have the best forecast if you're run, if you're really looking forward a uh, finely tuned application otherwise it is possible to use also uh, general purpose finite element simulation software and use an homogeneous edge dropping making some kind of average between along the flow and across the flow as soon as the wall thickness is above four or five millimeters you can use a homogeneous isotropic the issue is when the wall thickness is below 2.5 3 millimeters in that case if the shear stress if the shear gradient is high enough you will have a lot of orientation and you will lose a lot of thermal performance through plane and in that very case it is much better if you need if you use a proper a proper software can you offer your support for simulation and design to the customer for a new project of course we can uh, we have a, a fully equipped a fully equipped um, system here we have two engineers working for time on infinite element analysis and uh, uh, technical assistance in co-design uh, our research and development can also help you with in fine-tuning the materials because not all materials work perfectly since the very beginnings time to time it's necessary to, to tune the, the materials to improve a little, bit, a little bit fluidity or whatever so research and development can do a lot on that and um, but anyhow, yes, we can help you in selecting the best material for your application. We give a look at the geometry. We provide the first, uh, the first, let's say, the first suggestions, and then if the customer is willing to move forward, we can uh, we can help him with uh, co-design and, and uh, let's say uh, finite, element, finite element analysis up to the production start. We go to the customer and we start the production with the customer at the machine. Okay. I think there are no more questions. We have been able to stay within one hour. So I would say that I thank you so much for your attention. Uh, you are still with me. I see a lot of people attending at, at, the, at this webinar. I really thank you for your attention. I strongly recommend you to visit our website and to drop an email to my, myself or to Mr. Donkin for any kind of question if you want to share with us your experience, if you want to have some, let me say, some expertise, some share some, uh, some, some experience about thermally conductive compounds and projects, especially looking forward at the forthcoming development in industrial uh, sectors like electric automotive, uh, electronics, communications, and so on. Thank you so much. Thank Andrew. Thank Plastic City Media. And see you at the next webinar. Bye-bye.